Um, hey everybody, welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. Today we are talking about squid senses with Carly York. It's gonna be great because at Skype a Scientist, we love squid, if you haven't realized that already. So, um, housekeeping, um, what's today, Tuesday? Thursday night, we're gonna be doing a trivia night for adults. Um, you can check that out on, uh, if you go to just like our Twitter, at Skype Scientist, you'll see all about it. It's five bucks to play and it really helps support our program. We're also trying to build up a fund um, to support uh, marginalized science communicators because it's really important in science communication for as many different voices to be heard by the public as humanly possible. And so we're trying to uh, financially support that. So going to trivia basically feeds directly into that fund and also it's a very fun way to spend your Thursday night. Um, Carly will be joining us for that as will a couple other squid biologists. Some of the questions will be about squid um, and others will just be about like sci-fi movies and other things you do not have to be a scientist to attend. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's Thursday night. And then Friday, we're gonna be talking about cuttlefish, which are one of my favorite cephalopods, um, although I love all cephalopods, but cuttlefish are really excellent. And we're gonna be talking about them at 1 p.m. on Friday. Friday night, we're trying something a little different. We have um, a squid biologist named Casey Zakroff. He it works on how climate change is affecting squid. Um, and he also really likes doing tabletop gaming. Um, I have no idea what tabletop gaming like actually is. Like I have a vague sense that Dungeons and Dragons has something to do with it, but like that's the end of my understanding. So I'm just gonna dive in with him. We're gonna collectively play a game that's squid themed. So we're gonna learn about squid while playing this game. And we're also gonna have mini games that the audience can play along with. It's gonna be me, him, Dana Stock, who um, wrote a phenomenal book about squid evolution that if you're interested in squid after this week, you should check out. It's called, um, well, it was called Squid Empire. I believe they recently changed the name through a rebranding, but if you look up Squid Empire, um, you'll find it. It is a page turner. Um, I am a squid biologist, but still, I think anybody would think it's a page turner. Um, and also a shark biologist and um, an artificial intelligence scientist. So gonna be a good time. Um, that'll be up on our website soon. Um, that's really all the housekeeping we have today. Um, so Carly, do you want to introduce yourself, say who you are, what you do, why you like it, and then we'll launch into questions. Sure. Uh, I'm Carly York, and I'm a biology professor and an animal physiologist. Um, I teach at a school in Western North Carolina called Lenore Rhine University, um, and I love squid. So I got my PhD studying squid and how squid avoid predators. So of course, a big part of how squid avoid predators is by using their different sensory systems. So I was really interested in like keying in on, um, you know, their really specific environment and their, their unique senses that they have to um, be well adapted to that environment and how that helps them to avoid predators. Um, and I was also interested in looking at this from the time they hatch out as little itty bitty um, paralarvae is what we call some species of baby squid um, to when they're full grown adults and how those sensory systems change throughout that time. Awesome. Okay, so can we go over like, so yesterday with Brett, we talked a little bit about the different ways that a baby squid can be a baby squid, basically. Okay. Um, so there are, but not everybody that here is here today was here yesterday. So. <laughs> you mentioned the word air <laughs> larvae. <laughs> you know what that means? Yeah. So um, in some species, they're called paralarvae because um, when they hatch, they are quite different than when they are full-grown adults. Um, but it's not like a full metamorphosis like you might see in, say, a butterfly, where it's going from a caterpillar to um, a butterfly. Instead, we're looking at some more subtle changes, but they're different enough to kind of give them this title of paralarvae. Um, so often the paralarvae are going to have these kind of like big round fat little bodies, but they're very, very tiny. The piece, the species I worked on was like, if you have a little bit of, of nail growing, it probably would fit on that at like 0.18 millimeters they were, or centimeters. Tiny. Maybe millimeters. Um, so very, very tiny little guys. Um, so their ecology is going to be different because they're that small. 
Um, they're going to be mostly planktonic and kind of at the mercy of the ocean's currents. Um, and then there's also some difference within the physics of how they're going to swim. Uh, Reynolds numbers are a big thing that comes into play when we talk about squid swimming, which was also part of what I studied. Um, and then as they grow, they become more streamlined and start to look, you know, like, like the adult squid that you expect to see. Right. Um, so, so for a little bit of background, I worked on um, how little baby squid uh, can kind of find the right type of bacteria in the seawater. Um, I specifically worked on how the immune system played a role in that. But broadly speaking, um, when you have, when you think of swimming in a pool in the summer, like you think of water as being kind of easy to move through. Like it's not giving you a lot of pressure. Um, it's like water, not like molasses, you know, but at teeny, teeny, tiny little drops, when the squid would be breathing effectively and swimming, you would take this little like water balloon basically and pushing water out and breathing water in, but it doesn't look the same, right? Like water at small volumes behaves totally differently, right? Yeah, so it's more like they're like swimming through honey at that stage. Yeah. Um, they're not gonna glide through water like the way our grown-ups will. Instead, swimming's a lot harder. They're not gonna get very far just you know, from the mercy of, of physics alone, they're gonna have to work pretty hard to move. Yeah, it's wild to think about. Um, <laughs> viscosity of water at small volumes is not a thing I thought about growing up. And then when you see these models of like how the particles in water move at small volumes, it's like very strange and very cool. Um, okay, so Robert says, what was the little squid video from yesterday? Oh, the little squid that we talked about yesterday is called idiosepius. I will write that um, in the chat because we were talking about idiosepius and how they stick on to blades of seagrass. Oh, uh, cool. That's really cute. Okay, so can you just tell us like what are the senses? Like we have our five senses. We know what the deal mm -hmm. is there. What is squid working with? Uh, well, the most prominent sense that our squid have is vision. Um, they, of course, have these like really big eyes, um, you know, proportionately in almost all species, their eyes are quite large. In our giant squid, and our colossal squid, they're like the size of a dinner plate, they're, like 16 inches diameter. Um, they also have camera eyes, which is incredibly unique for an invertebrate. Um, vertebrates have camera eyes, but um, in terms of a camera eye and an invert, our cephalopods stand alone. Um, so when you just look at the eye of a squid, they're, they're really quite similar to what we see in vertebrates. There's some, some physiology differences there, but um, they're really, really advanced for an invertebrate. Um, so vision, super important. Um, but another sense that they rely heavily on that doesn't get talked about quite as much is mechanoreception which is their ability to um, feel how the water is moving around them. So what my research was actually focused on was a system called the lateral line analog. And um, fish have a lateral line. It runs laterally down the side of the body. Um, if you're someone who fishes often, you've probably seen it. It's easy to spot. Um, and along this lateral line are thousands of tiny little hair cells. And those hair cells are all connected to nerves. So when that hair cell gets pushed around, it tells the fish what direction the water's moving. Um, and squid have a really similar system. Um, when they first discovered this, it was like in the 80s when the literature started really coming out on this, um, they, they weren't particularly creative in the name, so they called it the lateral line analog but it doesn't run laterally along the side of the body like it does in fish. So it's a little bit confusing. It actually runs on the head and down the arms of the animal, but isn't on the side of the body at all. So the name is kind of a bummer. Um, it's just confusing to talk about it because it's not lateral at all, but it's the same kind of system. So there's like thousands of little tiny hair cells all over them that help them to determine uh, what direction water's moving. And this becomes really important when we talk about how they avoid a predator, right? To be able to actually detect a predator coming. Um, so their lines are at the sensitivity where they could detect a one meter fish coming in their direction from about 30 meters away. 
which is long enough that they could get out of Dodge, um, which is the number one anti-predator defense is leaving. And if you can know you should leave a little bit sooner, then that's great. Um, so those are the two major senses that they're going to rely on in a predator situation. Um, they do have chemoreception, so they can smell things. Um, and then and taste too. Those senses get a little bit muddled when we talk about aquatic animals, um, but the ability to pick up chemicals in these different ways is useful too. Um, and in terms of chemoreception, there's some interesting thoughts about how they might use their ink um, as like maybe a, a cue when they're talking to each other, if there's a predator around as well. Um, their ink has certain chemicals in them like dopamine and L-dopa, which to us are feel-good chemicals. Um, and it's possible that those could also be used for communication within our squid as well. Super cool. Super cool. And so L-dopa and dopamine, those are neurotransmitters for us. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah. so they work basically as like uh, brain communication within your brain, right? Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> yeah. Um, awesome. So here's a question from Haley. Uh, given how small the squidlets are and how hard it is to swim at a small Reynolds number, do they often perish from the energy of swimming through honey? Hmm. Um, that would be an interesting way to look at it. I, I'm not sure how to know whether they would just like die of exhaustion versus die of something eating them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did spend some time looking at anti-predator behavior in the paralarvae, um, and it was kind of interesting. It does look like they, they still use this lateral line system a little bit, even when they're itty bitty. And maybe at that point that that's even the sense they rely on more than vision, um, probably just because of that point in development and, you know, then things progress. Um, but the other things that paralarvae do that are kind of just weird is they have these weird, um, like, when you watch a paralarvae swim, they don't just, like, swim around in a nice orientation. They do these cool little, like, loopy loopies all over the place. Um, and then they zigzag and they zip all around. Like, it's really kind of chaotic and unorganized. Um, and while they're doing that, they also keep their bodies super clear instead of changing to a bunch of different colors. And when they're clear and tiny and zipping around, it actually makes them kind of elusive to a predator. Like it's hard to catch something that's being totally random. Yeah. So it's like, that's kind of how they rely. Uh, they rely on, on this behavior m more than like actually knowing what colors to change to at different points and what direction to swim. Yeah. They're itty bitty. That's super cool. I didn't know that. I, so the animal that I worked on is the Hawaiian bobtail squid. And mm -hmm. unlike the squid that uh, Carly's talking about, my squid are come out basically is just like tiny adults. They look almost the same. They're like, their fins are a little bit bigger with relation to their body, but they don't do this paralarval stuff. They pretty much just look like bobtail squid adults, um, which also is, very cute. And that's also true of cuttlefish, like yeah. baby cuttlefish that just look like adult cuttlefish, but small makes me just want to scream. It's so cute, but <laughs> they don't do this stuff. So this is really cool for me to hear about. I love that. Um, so, okay. Haley's got another follow-up, very important question. If squid could figure out a way to stay on land for long periods of time, do you think that squid and octopuses or cephalopods in general would be our uh, reigning overlords? <laughs> um, I'd like to imagine it at least. It would be a cool reality. And I bet you they would like make people wear masks. They I would bet. thing with like all eight of those arms and two tentacles to be like- Handing masks out. Just your mask on. And they wouldn't even question it because they're very smart. That's true. We talked all about animal intelligence yesterday and how to measure it and like how it's kind of hard to, to talk about. So that's- that's great. Um, the next question is, is squid ink actually ink? Um, well, it has a few major components to it, right? We talked about the chemicals, um, and then it has mucus, which gives it the, like, this kind of a, a consistency to it, and then melanin, uh, which gives it 
the dark color. Um, so that's going to be made through like the same kind of hormonal pathway that happens when our skin tans or how we get different uh, phenotypic coloration in our hair and stuff. So um, I, it's not the same as like ink in a big pen, but I, I honestly, like I should know this is the history. Was squid ink used as ink? Um, I'm just realizing I don't know what ink in a pen actually is. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I'm very familiar with what squid ink is. Yeah. I don't even know what's in a Bic pen. It's... I don't know, but I know they used to use sepia, so uh, cuttlefish ink for um, all sorts of stuff. And so oh. that was ink used in ink. If you ever get squid ink pasta, the black pasta, that is legitimately squid ink. Um, certainly you can paint with squid ink, you can write with squid ink, like, you can dye things with squid ink. Um, I just, maybe it's just like easier to use whatever the heck is in a Bic pen now with industrial whatever. But um, I mean, I would say is squid ink ink? My answer is yes, because it's a pigment and you can use it as ink. So sure. I'll support that. Yeah. Because I don't really know, like if you go to Staples, how many different kinds of ink are there? Yeah. Uh, literally no idea. Couldn't tell you. But anyway. Yeah, I think the answer is yes. Um, here's another ink question. How does squid make ink? Um, they have a specific gland that they use in order to make their ink. Um, and it's funny because I had actually contacted Sarah like a while ago and been like, people keep asking me um, if they can ever run out of ink. And I just like couldn't find the real answer to the question. And Apparently, the answer is is no. They just keep producing this. Like if, if an if a squid perhaps was like literally inking all day long, I think eventually they would have to. Then I think they can squirt it out faster than they can make it. But like that actually never happens in real life because we I've had squid in the lab that are just like aggressively inking and they can fill a bucket no problem. It's wild. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I'll say in, in my paralarvae baby squid, and the species that I worked with, um, the babies, they're called Dortuthus pilei, um, and they are found sort of from like Delaware up as sort of like inshore squid, and um, the babies like barely ever inked. I know they can, like I got like a few little moments on video where they would ink but it wasn't something they used to um, deter a predator at all. So I don't know if just at that itty bitty stage, they're not quite ready to spend the energy on making ink. And when I was looking at them, they were like 24 to 48 hours old um, because unlike um, Brett, I, I have not mastered raising cephalopods. Yeah. And these guys are really, really tricky. To oh, yeah. I don't think I don't think anyone there's maybe one person who's who's gotten a dory toothus. So the the like the kind of squid that you'd get when you get order calamari basically is the kind of squid you should be imagining. Um those uh are so hard to raise. I don't know how anybody does it. Yeah, they have <laughs> they have no concept of walls. So keeping them in captivity is really hard. They just keep bouncing against walls until they hurt themselves. Yeah. yeah. My little bobtail squid are a lot easier. They're little like dumpling shaped and they definitely ink from day one. Yeah. Um, and they make these little like blobs that are their size and shape. And so they'll make like five little blobs in a row and it's, it's very funny and cute. Um, but they'll definitely, definitely ink at you from day one. Um, Arjun would like to know why do squid make ink? Um, so mostly it's been used, thought to be used as an anti-predator behavior. Um, and they can make these different shapes. So they can do these, like, they can make ones that are about the same size as their own body. And we call those pseudomorphs. So there's like, they're these decoys that the predators will go and chomp on instead of the squid. And there's some thought that maybe even that dopamine makes them feel kind of happy and go on about their happy way while the squid escapes. Um, and they can also just do these big smoke screens for it's just a huge mess in the escape. They can do these little tiny boop, boop, boops. Um, there's a bunch of different shapes that they can make. Um, so 
anti-predator behavior is the number one reason, but then there is kind of just this idea that maybe they're using it for communication as well. Um, there hasn't been a ton that's been published on this. It was something I was really like wanting to look into a little bit more, particularly because of those chemicals that even those, those little like poof poof inks, that that could be a way to tell other squid that something something's going down. But I, I don't know for sure on that one. Yeah, there's some videos of these deep sea squid that are just like, it almost looks like they're smoking a cigarette. They're like very slowly letting out these little clouds of ink. Um, and that, I, for the deep sea squid to find each other, that's been hypothesized, but I don't think anybody's like done the rigorous experiment to prove that that's what's happening, or at least support that that's what's happening. Um, but yeah, it's super cool. Um, the next question is from Dexter, age eight, and Milo, age nine. Um, did anyone try to discourage you from squid biology? That's a really interesting question. Um, yes, I have had a bit of um, a zigzaggy trajectory myself in biology. Um, my undergraduate degree was actually in exercise physiology and I was studying um, humans, although to be honest, I actually wanted to apply that knowledge to horses. So people were never really like what I was into, but I was trying to do like a sports medicine thing. Um, and another reason was I was kind of scared to study biology at the time, which was really silly because biology is the greatest thing ever. So if you're even a little bit scared, don't be just like throw yourself at it. Um, I realized maybe like halfway through my college career that I made a mistake, but I just kind of had to keep chugging at that point. So I graduated, I took a year off, and I worked at the North Carolina Zoo for a year and took some extra classes to get my biology stuff um, a little boosted and then applying for master's programs where I studied equine, so horse social behavior and stress physiology. Um, so I came back around to the horses a little bit. Um, and while I was there, I took, I was in Kentucky. I was, I was totally landlocked in Kentucky and I told, um, or I took a marine biology class that I honestly didn't even really want to take, but classes were limited and um, all the grad students had to give a lecture on something and I ended up giving a lecture on cephalopods and I fell in love. And I decided that if I was going on for a doctorate, I really, really, really wanted to study cephalopods. Um, so I told my advisor at the time this and as a uh, mammal physiologist, he was not happy that he was training a mammal physiologist who was going to jump ship or get on the ship and go study squid instead. So he, he gave me a little bit of trouble just in my next steps of life. Um, and uh, whatever, I did it anyways. <laughs> and I'm really, really happy that I did. Awesome. Um, the next question is, uh, what is your favorite type of squid that you've worked with um, that you thought had a really cool squid sense? Um, so I've really only worked with two species, um, the Dorytuthus and Lalagunkula brevis, which is kind of, it's like the same sort of type of a squid, only found south. So like where Dorytuthus stops, Lalagunkula starts. Um, so I have to say there's a special place in my heart for Lollygunkula. They're not the weirdest squid. Um, they're pretty small. They're only like this big, um, but they're beautiful. They have these um, aridophores right behind their eyes that are bright green and um, they're gonna be my favorite squid for forever because they did help me get my doctorate. I would love to study the senses of some of the weirder deep sea squid for sure. I bet you they got some weird stuff going on. For sure, totally. Um, and we actually briefly mentioned Lollagunkula yesterday because they're the squid that go the closest to freshwater. Um, Absolutely, yeah. So I used to catch them in the Chesapeake Bay. We didn't even go out to the ocean. That's really super cool. How do you catch a squid? How do you do it? Uh, the way we caught this species was um, through trawling. So we'd go out on a little boat, we'd toss a net behind us, go really slowly for a little time. Um, me and my, my lab mate would go, we would had to pull it up by hand. Some fancy boats have a, like a yeah. system. We didn't have that. So we would pull it up by hand and you hope for the best. Um, when you see a squid, you yell squid and move really quickly and get through everything in the net. And 
um, we would always have ink buckets set aside. So they'd first go in the ink buckets so they could make a mess. And then we'd put them into the cooler where they'd stay. Um, so we were about an hour and a half away from where we'd go trawling. So they'd get in a cooler, we'd drive home as fast as we possibly can, and then get them situated in the lab. Awesome. Um, the next question is, what, uh, what eats squid? What are the squid predators? Everything. <laughs> Everything eats a squid. Um, fish eat squid. Um, our marine mammals eat squid. Whales and dolphins, our sea lions and seals. Um, marine birds eat a squid. Mm -hmm. um, and other squid eat squid too. Yep. So, yeah, they are, they have predators every which direction. So having these really cool uh, senses is, is I, it's got to be why they have such a robust evolutionary history to be able to survive long enough to reproduce and then, you know, get eaten by <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, if you could pick one species of squid that you could work with in the future that you haven't worked with in the past, what squid would it be? Um, if I was just focused on senses, it'd probably be the strawberry squid. Um, oh, tell us more about strawberry squid. So first of all, they, they do kind of look like strawberries. They have these um, this really interesting pattern on their skin that isn't seen in other types of squid. Um, but the weirder part about them is that they have one really big eye and one really little eye. And it's weird. Like if you looked at them from different sides, you would think they were completely different. Um, but we think that they evolved to have this adaptation because they're using their big eye to actually like look down and their little one to look up so they're able to have better vision in both directions by having this really weird eye situation. So that would be a particularly neat one to look at how, how, their, um, how their vision helps them avoid a predator. Yeah, definitely go on YouTube, look up strawberry squid. It's wild. Like you think, it's going to be weird. And then you see it and you're like, well, that's even weirder than I <laughs> They're great. Um, awesome. So as a scientist, what do you do in your free time? Um, so I actually have a little farm that I have on the side, you know, as a side gig, um, mm -hmm. where I have a little collection of, of rescue critters. I actually just got a new miniature donkey this weekend, and I think I had like my first viral Twitter thing go on. I didn't know how much Twitter needed a donkey. I needed it. Um, but yeah, and she's, she's wonderful. Um, so I have now two miniature donkeys, a horse, a little group of chickens, and um, trying to like be a good earthling and learn how to grow food on my own too. So I have some gardens I'm working on, learning how to compost trying to do the things that they say we should do to be good earthlings. Sounds good. Um, I have no yard whatsoever. I'm in the city. I've got a slab of concrete out back. That's basically all I've got going on. So I'm a yeah. little jealous. I've got lots of animals in the house, but nothing else. I've got some flowers outside in a pot. It's depressing. Um, <laughs> the next question is from Emma. Do you have any squid in your house? Oh my gosh, I do not. I, <laughs> I wish I did, but Keeping squid is, it's not really hard. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a job. And even in a lab where everything was like set up just to take care of squid, it's still really hard. Um, they actually pump out a ton of ammonia as a waste product. So they basically like create toxic environments for themselves pretty instantly, unless you have really good filtration systems. Um, so it's tough. Like, there's a reason you don't ever see squid being sold in pet stores or even really, they're rarely kept in aquaria. Um, like, Monterey Bay, they've figured out some really cool things. But most aquariums that you go to, you'll see cuttlefish, you'll see an octopus, but you're probably not going to see a squid. Um, if you do, it's probably a bobtail. Um, yeah. But they're, they are so hard to keep. So, no, I'm kind of happy to not have a squid in my house, actually. Yeah, I, 
am Squid's biggest fan, arguably. Like, I'm on the top 10 people who love Squid the most. Having a Squid in your house, I'm not going to say it's a nightmare, but it's like, it's, I don't want to say it's as hard as having a child, but it's like, it's really hard. Like, imagine having just like running a marathon 100% of the time. That's the amount of food that they need. And then also the amount of waste that they're putting out. So you kind of need a swimming pool amount of water to keep them going. And so the aquaria that have cephalopods like that successfully often are directly on the ocean because you need to pull water in from the ocean and put it right back. Because when you have an aquarium and maybe at home you have um, an aquarium like you have a little filter and in that filter there's a bunch of bacteria and that bacteria basically munches on all of the waste products from the squid and then it, it's like it's really pretty complicated like so the one group of bacteria munches on squid waste and then that produces its own waste and then a second group of bacteria munch on that waste and then a third bunch of bacteria munch on that waste and eventually nitrogen goes into the air and our how much of our atmosphere is nitrogen like 80 percent or something that's the number i had come to mind great good so we're both on the same page so something like like the air you breathe right now is a lot of nitrogen and so um that's fine if it goes into the air because that's what's already there and so you need a absurd amount of bacteria munching all the time to keep a squid healthy um but come on, talk about thoughts of them yeah still a lot still even keep some some fish some little mummy chugs in the tanks to like help with this bacteria situation but the squid would just eat them the squid eat, eat most things they would i mean it was impressive you'd have a squid this big take on a fish this big it just wraps its arms around it and it decapitates it yep. and eats everything but the head we just yeah. kind of find little heads at the bottom of the tank unbelievable squid are intense predators one of the other question is what do squid eat so okay uh crabs shrimp fish it honestly depends on the squid species because like our little bobtail squid will stick their noses up in anything that's not a shrimp all they want is shrimp so fine but like cuttlefish will eat all sorts of stuff shrimp crabs fish whatever yeah i used to go to the pet stores and clean out their minnow supply yeah um, yeah they were freshwater minnows so it wasn't perfect but i would just like toss them in there and within seconds they would be yeah we had um, the Dory to this, so like the calamari squid basically in our lab for like two weeks. And the number of goldfish we went through was wild. Yeah. I could not believe, I mean, yeah, we, the poor pet star was like, what are you doing with these fish? I was like, nothing, nothing. Um, yeah. So it's wild. Okay. So we answered, what do squid eat? Um, Grant and Grayson, uh, specifically Grant, age 10, would like to know, do you ever track squid? And if so, how do you track them? I have not done that, but there is a, a group of scientists up at um, Woods Hole um, who is working on tracking them, and they've developed a really special tracker because um, it's it's really difficult with squid because their skin is really delicate and kind of slimy. Like it's not the same as a turtle shell. You might see a tracker, um, so they've been working really hard to find the right kind of like adhesive that'll actually stick to, to the squid. Um, Sarah, do you know any more about, about that? Yeah. So my buddy Diana um, has stuck stuff to squid before and there's this very oh. specific glue. So basically you take the squid and you like take part of its body and take it out of the water while its face basically is still able to breathe the water. You pat it dry. You use this very specific glue. Like your regular glues are not gonna work on squid because um, they just like, it's things are slimy and you needed to be able to stick to slime. It's very strange. And then you can glue stuff to it. There's also these little things called pit tags. They kind of look like, like a Tylenol. They're that size. And you can stick them in the squid skin, but it's not as good as some other stuff. Like it can record some stuff, but it's not going to give you like, you're not going to get camera data. You're not going to get as much information as you could with other things. There's one group that basically like put, it almost looks like a thunder shirt on a dog, like a tight little t-shirt kind of onto the squid that had a camera on top. That was with the Humboldt squid. Humboldt squid are super cool. They're about six, well, the big ones are like six feet long. Some of them are a lot smaller. Um, they live off California down to 
uh, Baja and they uh, are huge and powerful and super cool. They live in big groups. When they communicate with each other, they flash white and red. Um, they're stunning and really cool. And so people wanted to know like, what are these squid getting up to? So they put a camera on it um, to watch with that. And that's called critter cam. And they have put critter cams on all sorts of animals. Um, so they are very good at sticking stuff on animals. Cool. I, silly me, I worked with Diana on that. I just forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, we have one question. Is there any squid that have no natural predators? I feel like no. Say no. I think all squid have predators. Mm -hmm. What what eats a colossal squid? I I don't I mean I'd say whales. Whales. Yeah. Probably whales, whales eat giant squid. So there's yeah. giant squid, which are very, very big, but kind of skinny. Uh skinny ish. And then there are colossal squid, which are like really rotund. They're like imagine like a pear with big fins on it. Like they're very thick um and so they live in the southern ocean i well when they're small i'm sure things eat them all the time but the big 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 guys probably whales i don't really know no um we don't know much about that species because the southern ocean is very cold very rough like the waves basically just circle and circle around antarctica and so they don't have a continent to kind of smack into to stop them from getting bigger and so it's very dangerous for humans to go down there um and so we kind of didn't go for much of human history because we would just die but now i guess we figured it out i don't really honestly know how we do that but power to the scientists who do um and so we'll send submersibles down and look for stuff and we're learning stuff about the southern ocean all the time have you on time pretty good pretty good okay um Dexter, age eight, and Milo, age nine, would like to know, do humans drink or use squid ink for anything? Yeah, oh, uh, Sarah mentioned the black fettuccine. Um, yeah. Which is, I, I actually did accidentally order this once in a restaurant not knowing what it was. And it was while I was doing my squid research and my friends were like, you're eating squid ink. And I thought they were just messing with me. And uh -huh. so a bite and then it was like I had licked my lab wall yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, um so yeah that's people some people really enjoy that um taste um I feel like squid ink is in some other kinds of foods though I don't I've mostly seen it in pasta yeah um that's all I know about but who knows? Yeah. There's probably other things. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was used as, as like ink, ink, um, sepia toned things. That's ink, uh, squid ink rather. Uh, cuttlefish ink specifically, I believe. But honestly, squid ink and cuttlefish ink, same stuff. Um, yeah, that's all the uses of ink I'm aware of. Yeah. I probably to dye stuff back in the day, but not so much anymore. Yeah. Be a lot uh, of work. A lot of work, yeah. Uh, Dory would like to know, are there many people that study squid or cephalopods in general? Um, I, less than fish, for sure. Less than fish, less than okay. sharks. Yeah. But there's a fair number of us. Yeah. Uh, there are hundreds of us. Uh, <laughs> it feels like <laughs> there are dozens of us. Um, there are hundreds of us. Are there thousands of us? Don't think so. But there are definitely hundreds of us. We meet once every three years at a meeting called the uh, Cephalopod International, wait, Kayak, Cephalopod International Advisory Council, um, which is mostly folks from Europe, the US, Canada, Japan. Um, there are a ton of cephalopod scientists in Japan um, because right around that uh, country, there are tons of squid that live there. Um, like lots of different cephalopod species live around Japan and also Australia, tons of them in Australia as well. Um, because again, Australia's got a ton of cephalopods. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would find Bell Park. Yeah. That feels right. Um, <laughs> are there any squid that are dangerous for humans? I wouldn't. Well, I mean, there's stories, right? There's stories about people diving out with the Humboldts and them sort of like messing with masks. Um, yeah. And like Animal Planet has tried to make the giant squid scary, but 
yeah, I mean, you are you are not going to meet a giant squid out in the ocean. You're pretty unlikely to even meet a humble squid unless you're looking for them. Um, looking for them for sure. Yes. Yeah, so you are. I think you're perfectly safe out in the ocean. You're very unlikely to have a negative squid encounter. If you go snorkel down um, down in the Caribbean, you might meet some some reef squid that'll be curious and come look at you. But They're very cute. They are yeah. not going to hurt you. There's nothing a Caribbean reef squid that could do to hurt you. No. I literally can't imagine. <laughs> um, yeah, there are stories like, so people would go fishing for Humboldt squid, and they're very strong. And so they might pull you over. Like, while you're fishing for them, you might, like, fall over off the boat. But that's, you know, that's not too bad. There are fishermen stories of people getting eaten alive by those squid. But, like, unconfirmed. But, like, for you to get hurt by a squid, you needed to go to the squid. Like, it's not going to, if you're like, I don't like squid, I'm afraid of squid, you're officially safe. There's no situation where you're going to get hurt by a squid. Um, though, if you're diving, there are, like, octopuses are quite strong um, and quite curious. And so if they see air coming out of your, your regulator is, if you've never been diving, the thing that, like, you bite on and breathe through. So they definitely will pull it out. But again, it's because they're curious. It's not like they're attacking you. They're just like, what the heck? What's this? Um, but you kind of, again, have to let that happen. Like an octopus is not going to come out of, out of nowhere, grab your regulator. Like that's just not, you have to be playing with them first. But yeah, so you're pretty safe from cephalopods. Um, there are also tales of like the kraken. And so we think that the kraken is honestly just giant squid. Um, when, so giant squid are full of ammonia and that helps them maintain buoyancy where they're living. And so when a giant squid gets sick and is basically dying, you'll often just see them like at the top of the water, just feeling not great. Um, and so a lot of times squid will, um, and Carly, you can back me up or correct me on this, but basically like when a squid is out of it, um, they often just sort of like touch stuff. And I have, I've assumed that that's, be, and this is what I've seen in bobtail squid and cuttlefish that I've worked with. Um, and I kind of think that's just like how they're sensing where they are and also kind of tasting where they are because when uh, cephalopods touch things, they're also tasting them, which is a wild thing to think about. Um, yeah. And so I think, and many other cephalopod scientists I've talked to think this too, basically the kraken myth, we think, comes from floating, dying, giant squid. A ship will go by and be like, oh my God. And then it'll just kind of be like, what? Like, who are you? What's, what's happening? And just like touching the boat. And to someone who doesn't know what a giant squid is, that's very scary. Like a huge squid touching your boat. Like I wouldn't want that if I didn't know what a giant squid was um, or couldn't like recognize the difference between a healthy giant squid and a sick giant squid. If there's a big tentacled animal grabbing your boat, that's, that's a sea monster, right? So that's where we think the Kraken myth comes from, but you don't know. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Um, okay, let's see if there's any more questions we can answer quickly because we're a little bit over time here. Um, yeah, I think we're gonna ask you the final two questions that we ask everybody. Um, one being, what is one thing that you wish everybody in the world knew about your area of expertise? And the second is, what is something that you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? It can be <laughs> as silly and insignificant or like big picture important as you'd like. Oh gosh, I wish I had prepped. <laughs> um, in terms of like my area, I just wish people appreciated squid a little bit more. Um, they are so stinking cool and like their evolutionary history is amazing. Yes. Um, they're basically fish that went in a completely different direction. Um, and people pay a lot of attention to uh, the octopus and the cuttlefish and they deserve it but don't forget about the squid they're very very neat as well yeah. um and oh no that's so much pressure about the last one anything anywhere um oh i'm gonna botch it but i'm just gonna say that overall i just wish everybody would pay 
really close attention to their own little corner of the world and their ecosystem and how things are fitting together in that ecosystem and how they can play a role to maybe make that ecosystem a really healthy little corner. And if it involves a squid, then that's great. And you're really lucky to live on the coast. That's a great answer. That's a wonderful answer. That was not botched at all. That was great. Um, is there anything else you'd like to plug before we wrap up? Or is there any place we can find you on social media, anything like that? Sure. Um, I'm on Twitter. I am um, Biology Carly on Twitter. And um, again, we have all this neat stuff coming up for Cephalopod Week. So Thursday, join us again for trivia. Um, and then I also have another talk coming up on Sunday. It's with a new uh, video podcast group They're called The Sunday Talks. And I'm going to be giving a talk about um, some of the things that I talked to you about today. Um, a little bit more science-y. I'm going to show some graphs and stuff. I do have a video of one of the parallelity doing their weird little behavior. Okay. So that will be um, 11 o'clock Eastern time this Sunday. Great. Sounds good. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, I could talk about squid for hours and hours, but I've got to stop. Um, <laughs> and Erin, thank you uh, for signing for us today. Uh, I'm sorry. I had just had coffee, so I know I talked a little faster than usual. But thank you for handling that so well. Uh, all right. So we will see you all hopefully Thursday night or Friday night for the adults and uh, Friday at 1 p.m. for uh, everyone here who are talking about cuttlefish. Um, thank you again, everyone, for coming, and we'll see you later. Bye.